Are we sure? Okay, welcome to the Few Sages webinar for 2022. Um, just as the first announcement is become a member of Sages. If you're a resident, become a candidate member. Fuse was created because there is really a gap in knowledge and a gap in the sort of curriculum of surgery um, about the devices you use in the operating room. Uh, and if you go to the Fuse curriculum, either through the, um, the main Fuse didactics, and we have a hospital compliance module, you can learn all about the basics of energy and make the operating room a uh, safer space for your patients. So we've assembled a star-studded cast of the FUSE committee at SAGES. And I would encourage actually anybody who's on the call who's really enthusiastic about energy or knows a lot about energy to email us afterwards and let us know because we can include you in the SAGES committee and you can also contribute to um, broadening the understanding of, of surgical energy devices in the operating room. So with that, we're gonna start with what most folks call the bovi, right? It's not really the bovi because it's a monopolar instrument or it's, it's, a, it's an instrument that passes electricity through patients. And so Kinga Powers is gonna lead us off. Um, and Kinga, um, I have Kinga's introduction here. I apologize, I'm a little bit disorganized. But um, Kinga um, is an associate professor in the Department of Surgery Division of Bariatrics, Foregut and Advanced GI Surgery at Stony Brook Medicine. She did a fellowship of minimally invasive and bariatric surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess in 2007. And she developed in, at Beth Israel De uh, Deaconess an interest in both surgical education um, in, in energy and became a member of SAGES at that time. And with that, Kinga, why don't you lead us off and tell us the basic fundamentals of electrosurgery? Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen, um, and I'm going to start off here with my talk. So, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sages and the Fuse Committee for um, uh, giving me this uh, invitation to talk about the fundamentals of electrosurgery, surgery, which is sort of a tough, tough topic because it has a lot of science. Um, so, I, I'm going to try and make it entertaining, but it, it is a lot of... Uh, detailed information, so please bear with me. Um, and we can ask questions to sort of clarify things at the end. Um, I have personally uh, nothing to disclose. Um, so um, every surgeon here, I'm sure uses some form of energy devices in their operating room. And our goal as FUSE champions is to ensure that every surgeon has a sophisticated knowledge base on how each of these devices work and how best to achieve um, the efficient dissection without a, without, with, with good hemostasis, but without any um, energy related complications that actually happen more often than we'd like to admit sometimes, unfortunately. And it can be, uh, they can be a real source of trouble for patients and not to mention litigation. So um, I, we're gonna focus on radio frequency, which is uh, the most common energy source in our monopolar and bipolar devices. Um, also RFA and radiology and endoscopy uses this type of, type of energy. So it's important to know the fundamentals of how it's used. And I have six objections and I'll go over these six um, individually. The first one uh, will understand the nomenclature involved in radiofrequency electrosurgery. Um, so I just wanna reiterate what Tom said that um, we have to learn how to speak the modern language with, um, keeping in mind that um, we commonly refer to our energy devices as the bovi or the hot bovi or cautery. And we use these terms um, very um, sort of colloquially. And we say things like uh, burn or cauterize, uh, or we also use grounding pad or um, return electrode or something like that. And those terms, I wanna just emphasize that those are um, misleading because they're kind of um, don't relate to the actual fundamentals of electrosurgery. And William Bowby was actually a brilliant American scientist um, who sold his electrosurgical patent for $1 and died in poverty. There's a company named after him. And I guess we can still use his name to honor him. 
uh, but it, it, it doesn't, doesn't refer to the actual device that we use. Um, and so the new language uses things more like electrosurgical generator unit. The instruments are monopolar or bipolar instruments. And the techniques that we use are to vaporize, cut, desiccate, coagulate, fulgurate. And uh, we use things like the dispersive electrode and the active electrode. And those are the terminology that I will refer to throughout my slides. And I'll explain what those are. So um, what is cautery? This is definitely not what we use in the operating room. Um, cautery is the passive transfer of heat. So if you light a match and burn your finger, that's cautery and electrosurgery is definitely not cautery because we're not actually heating instruments and then transferring that heat. We use radio frequency electrosurgery, which is actually heating the tissue with um, electric current in a circuit. Um, so this, we're definitely not branding our patients we're using um, radio frequency electrocautery. So it's important. So it's an important concept to distinguish. And um, how does the radio frequency work then? So we know that uh, when an alternating current from our wall socket in the US, it's at 60 um, Hertz um, that comes out of the wall socket and it's converted to the correct frequency in our electrosurgical unit or the blue. Um, machine that is in our operating room. Um, so when this current is applied to patient tissues, it makes the intracellular electrically uh, charged particles, uh, including proteins and electrolytes, um, they start to move and oscillate back and forth inside the cell, um, including large proteins, which results in frictional forces that occur in the cell and that um, results in heat being created. Um, so radio frequency electrosurgery is the um, basically intracellular conversion of this electromagnetic energy that's applied to um, the cell and that's converted to kinetic energy and then to thermal energy. Um, so understanding how the surgical application of radio frequency works is um, requiring our understanding of the effects of heat on cells and tissues. So again, it's not cautery, but electric current that causes this, um, this thermal energy. Um, so we know that the normal temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. And when the temperature reaches 50 degrees Celsius, then we have cell death. Um, and this is kind of delayed cell death, drying out of the cells. Um, when the uh, temperature reaches 90 to 60 degrees, um, there's a more instantaneous death uh, of the cells. Um, at that point, there is desiccation and coagulation. And desiccation means drying or, or shrinking of the cells and coagulation means um, protein denaturation. Uh, so the proteins will kind of jumble up into random uh, forms and then they reform when the um, cells cool down, making this coagulum. Um, at higher temperatures, if you have 100, uh, degrees Celsius, there is instantaneous evaporation of, this is boiling temperature, so we get cell vaporization and cell then explodes in a cloud of steam and ions. And um, if you go even higher temperatures, you can get car um, carbonization or caramelization of the tissues uh, at these higher temperatures. Um, so let's talk about some of the basic functions of this electrosurgical generator uh, unit and how does it produce this electrical, electrical current and then how it travels through the patient in the circuit. Um, so the blue machine that we are all familiar with in the operating room is called the electrosurgical unit or ESU. Um, and it provides an alternating current. It's important to understand that it's not just straight current, but it's alternating in a sine wave. Um, and it's, um, it's a current for the radio frequency um, electrosurgery that we use in the patients um, with our active electrode or, or the pencil. Um, so what does that mean? We have the alternating current that comes out of the wall, like I said, 60 cycles per second, and that is converted in this um, ESU to about 500,000 cycles per second or 500 kilohertz. Um, and this is similar to the AM radio frequency 570 on, the, on your AM radio dial, that's, um, that's why it's called radio frequency electrosurgery because it's similar to the AM radio. Um, we can get 
uh, frequencies converted even higher, such as we get in our TVs. Um, but if we have the lower frequencies straight from the wall socket, then the tissue effects occur with um, activation, activating and depolarizing nerves and muscles. And we don't want that in our patient. So we have to convert it to this uh, really higher frequency um, alternating current. So once we have the current um, that is converted here, this is a picture of the um, electrosurgical unit and it has a wire here um, that enters the active electrode here. I don't know if you can see me pointing because I, I don't know if I have a pointer, here we go. Um, here is um, the active electrode and then the current travels through the patient to the dispersive electrode, which is wider um, and it gets dispersed and travels back to the electrosurgical unit. So the, the elements of the circuit are the ESU, the active electrode, the patient, the dispersive electrode, and then the current travels back to the um, ESU. And there's no grounding. There's uh, no connection to the ground anywhere. Um, the current travels back to the ESU. Um, the historically used grounded circuits, they increase the risk for current diversions through contact with conductive elements uh, like EKG wires or causing burns or metallic um, elements on the, on the uh, patient, uh, like on the OR table. So those haven't been used in over 40 years. Um, so we're using um, a, uh, a dispersive electrode, no, the grounding path. And this is definitely not cautery because there's a current. So the ESU does three things. We already, um, I already showed you how it converts the low frequency wall output to the high AM frequency um, of 500,000 Hertz. The second thing um, that it does is it allows you to adjust the voltage um, of the output. So something that you um, do indirectly by adjusting the power. So if you, if you put in the power uh, such as 30 or 20, that's power in Watts, which is actually equal to um, current times voltage. And so modern ESUs can sometimes alter the voltage in response to the change in um, like how the tissue responds, the tissue resistance or impedance. But most of the time uh, the, the ESUs that we use do not. So we have to be cognizant of what we set our power on and what, um, and later we'll talk about the duty cycle. But, um, so we usually choose this um, power in, in watts, the 20 or 30 watts. And remember that, um, just remember that concept that it depends, the power that you set depends on the uh, volts times current. So for the same power, if you increase the voltage and decrease the current, you'll have the same number or vice versa. Um, so the third thing that the ESU does is that you can set the mode, how the current comes out of the, uh, um, the generator. So the, 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 what is called the duty cycle or the terms um, coag, cut or blend choice determines the duty cycle or how the current comes out. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so just remember that for the same power with high voltage and low intermittent current, um, you can have the same power with low voltage and continuous current. Uh, and that's called the duty cycle. So let's go over the cut and coag and blend modes just to um, make it very clear. So this is a picture of a generator in blue and it can produce different waveforms of current. So we're gonna set it to either cu um, cut or coag and the orange is an oscilloscope, which is basically just shows the amount of energy and current that goes through a circuit. And I'll show you the differences between cut and coag. So most American uh, ESUs um, use these designations, cut, coag, and blend. And we'll start with the cut mode. So I'll set it on pure cut and we'll dial it up to 30 watts. And if we look at our oscilloscope, um, what's important here is that it's a continuous sine wave because the current is emitted 100% of the time and it's an alternating current. So you can see the sine wave and the, it's 30 joules per second is spread out through time. So it's a thin amplitude. You see the wave is very low amplitude. Um, so the voltage is low. So um, cut is a relatively low voltage continuous output waveform. 
um, but let's say we turn it up higher to 100, you can see that the voltage or the amplitude goes higher. So it's still 100% duty cycle. It comes out continuously without any breaks, but a higher voltage, higher amount of energy. Um, and if you go back to 30, then it goes back to that lower voltage, okay? So next is um, the cut. So how, so how does the cut um, work in contrast to the, uh, so, sorry, the, the coag? Next is the coag and how does it work in contrast to the cut? So if we look at the oscilloscope in orange, the, in this, the waveform, you can see that if you set the same amount of power at 30 in this situation, the current is only on up for about 6% of the time. So that's called the duty cycle. It's a 6% duty cycle. And it's a very short duty cycle and it's associated with much higher voltage. So the wave goes way higher uh, intermittently with the same power setting. Um, so if you've reduced the current, the voltage must be increased to maintain the wattage that you set. And what's really important about this is that the higher the voltage, the higher the risk of um, uh, electrosurgical um, uh, injuries. And we'll go over those as well uh, later on. So just remember that we want to accomplish our electrosurgical effects in the patient with the lowest voltage possible to avoid these injuries like thermal injuries or fires or interference with pacemakers and such. Um, so this is the 6% intermittent duty cycle. So what is the bland waveform? And many people think that it has to do with um, combining the cut and coag, but that's actually a misnomer. And it's um, to do with the duty cycle. So the coag, um, it actually can be set at zero and it's the same. Um, so in the blend waveform, you can use um, a low voltage or higher voltage, depending on what you set it on. But basically you set the, um, the percentage of the time that the current comes out of your ESU. So uh, if you can have it here um, at 50% and the voltage is a little bit higher than if you just had it on pure cut, um, but it's definitely lower than with the coag mode. So this is a 50% duty cycle in the blend mode. Um, and what's important here is um, that um, if you look here, this is sort of the summary gra graphic showing that showing the cut blend other and the coag mode here. And you can see the voltage, the height of these alternating uh, sine waves. You can see the height, that's the voltage. And you can see that with the coag, it's the high voltage. With cut, it's the lower voltage. But what's important here is the effect on the tissue. And here you can see um, that uh, the tissue effect is different with the lowest collateral damage or spread with the cut mode and the highest collateral damage or heat spread in the high voltage coag mode. So um, you can also see that um, in a um, video here, you can see the cut and the coag with the blue button. The blend is actually the yellow button as well. You just set a different percentage of the duty cycle. And you can see that tissue heats uh, when the waveform spike and cools down, and that produces the coagulation of the um, cells and the, um, there is um, a deeper, um, wider spread and with more collateral damage with the coag button here, as you can see. Okay. So next we're gonna talk about differences between monopolar and bipolar instruments. And um, basically, you can think of all electrosurgery as bipolar because there are always two electrodes. And what differentiates the monopolar from bipolar is actually the location of these two uh, electrodes. So here you can see in the monopolar mode, the instrument, um, like I showed before, the electrosurgical um, the, pencil or the active electrode, the handheld pencil um, is here and the patient is this yellow blob and then the uh, dispersive electrode is in green. So the, the current actually goes through the patient um, and disperses into the, um, the wide active electrode 
and in the bipolar with the bipolar instrument system it contains both of the electrodes in the circuit um, right at the patient so to complete the circuit the only part of the patient that's involved is that which is between the jaws of the instrument so immediately adjacent to the two electrodes in between here um, which with the bipolar instruments it actually eliminates the risk of current diversion and i think my colleagues will talk about that a little in a little bit uh, about the different types of injury or um, uh, the thermal in, thermal injuries with electrosurgery uh, but bipolar energy eliminates current diversion uh, it, that occurs with these monopolar systems. So that's the advantage of the bipolar instruments. Um, next, we're gonna talk about the difference between the different tissue effects, such as vaporization, cutting, versus desiccation and coagulation. Um, so let's talk about uh, creating uh, those different tissue effects uh, with our active electrode here. This is the monopolar instrument. And you can recognize the, the white uh, monopolar pencil with the cut and the coag buttons. Um, and in the there's the non-contact modes and there's the contact mode. So in the non-contact modes, there is vaporization, which uses low voltage outputs, such as the cut mode, and fulguration, which is um, a, basically a process of high voltage where tissue is superficially coagulated, um, by, but with a widespread, uh, because there is a, um, elevation of temperature on the coag mode um, to a very high uh, degrees of Celsius, so over 100 degrees of Celsius. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so the cut mode has the lowest voltage. Like we said, you have the continuous kind of spread out thin current, continuous um, for the set power. And it is designed to divide tissues with the highest concentration of heat, but very little collateral damage. Um, so there's very little coagulation or desiccation of tissue. And this mode, uses this um, low voltage waveform um, and produces a very maximum current concentration. So if we're, for example, cutting around sensitive structures such as around nerves during thyroid surgery or like if we're doing a lap coli and uh, we don't wanna injure the duodenum, we don't wanna have a high or deep thermal spread, we use the cut mode um, to avoid these kind of injuries yellow button cut mode, not the blue button coag mode, okay? So another non-touch mode is the fulguration, which is the opposite of the non-touch technique. Um, and it's basically a visible arc between the tissue and the electrode. It's a high voltage mode on the blue uh, coag button. It can reach over 200 degrees Celsius and more, and it causes desiccation and breakdown of the, um, all the organic molecules and um, also carbon. So there's a dark hue to the coagulated tissues um, that's called carbonization. And um, it, um, it is actually very shallow. There's not a lot of um, spread of the deeper spread. And so it's, um, uh, it's very useful in, um, if you're trying to control bleeding over sensitive areas, such as on the spleen or um, in the colon, for example, this is used a lot um, in using the argon beam, which is uses fulguration in endoscopic, sur endoscopic surgery. So it's a high voltage modulated current, uh, no touch technique, large surface area of the electrode. So like I said, an example of this is the argon beam plasma coagulator and it's a monopolar device. It uses the um, argon gas to arc the current, and it's the current is sprayed onto the tissues, doesn't go very deep. Usually it's recommended that we use 20 watts or lower uh, on the coag setting for, especially in endoscopy. So um, just remember that the argon gas is actually a, a gas and it's emitted, so it, um, it actually helps to clear off some of the blood on the surface, but also it can uh, go into the parent. If you're doing it in laparoscopic surgery or in the or in endoscopy, it can increase the gas content in the enclosed space. So you have to suction it or release the gas, and you, it can also cause gas embolism. So you have to be um, cognizant of that. All right. So um, on the other spectrum, we have the contact modes used for desiccation or coagulation. 
and um, uh, the main purpose of this um, this mode is actually to um, seal vessels and other uh, tissues that contain uh, capillaries and to, to um, cause coagulation. So the, the main point of talking about this is that um, although any kind of waveform may be used for, for, for sealing a vessel, uh, for coaptic coagulation or for when you're touching, when you're um, holding a blood vessel in between your debakis, for example, and you want to seal it, you should be performing this function with a low voltage continuous output from the cut mode, the yellow button, not the, mo not the high voltage coag uh, output. And, you know, people want to know why, and I'll just explain that. And this is because a continuous low voltage output, um, actually when you have the cut, it results in a more homogeneous uh, coagulation of that vessel, vessel and it's a predictable um, zone of coagulation. Whereas with the coag, it's very, um, it's not uh, predictable and it's um, variable. So you may see a vessel, you may not, it doesn't work as well. Um, and most of the bipolar devices use the continuous low voltage cut mode to seal vessels. So just to give you an idea, this is what it looks like. Um, when you use the coag mode, a high voltage output comes out and you bring, uh, when you bring this electrode close to the tissues of the patients, the yellow blob, and you have a superficial zone of desiccation. So you can see that kind of uh, dark carbonation, and you think that you seal the vessel, but it actually acts as an insulator, and that will actually subsequently uh, prevent the sealing of the vessel and the, um, the transfer of the current. So um, it doesn't work as well as the cut mode. When you use the cut mode, you actually get the sealing of the vessel. The, the, the tissue is healed more slowly and more evenly. Um, with the continuous current. This is another picture of this. Um, so this is your cutting mode um, and the coag mode with the high voltage, which results in this sort of uneven, um, less effective seal of the blood vessel. And it also causes this kind of uh, caramelization of the sugars inside the cells and causes a sticking effect. Um, so it's hard to open the forceps. In fact, when you open the forceps, sometimes you disrupt the coagulum and the stickiness and it actually opens the vessel. So it's not as effective. Um, so the next concept and the last one I'm gonna talk about because I maybe over time, I don't know. Uh, yes, I am. Um, is uh, the concept of current density. And this is the last thing I'm gonna talk about. It's a very important thing because electrosurgery is ultimately about controlling current density. And it's a fairly easy concept because basically it says that the smaller the contact area that you use um, in your active electrode, um, like a needle nose cautery versus like a paddle, um, the higher the current concentration um, and the heat is applied to the tissue proportionally because this current density or the thermal change is proportional to the um, current per area squared. So just always remember that um, equation and you know that when you're, you can achieve the same tissue effect with um, using the, the different edges of your instrument. So if you operate, look at the blade of your active electrode very carefully. When the edge of the tip is against the tissue, then you will have um, a small surface area and a high current density, which will cause vaporization and result in this tissue cutting. And with the same setting, when the blade is flat, then you will get uh, a medium current density, and then you will get more desiccation and protein coagulation with the same current spread, like if it's spread over a wider area. So just be cognizant of how you're using your instruments. 
So this is to summarize the things that impact the thermal effect in tissues are the power setting or the watts on your um, ESU set on the lowest setting that you can to achieve what you need, the generator mode or duty cycle, such as coag, cut coag blend or other, and the cut is the, um, the low voltage mode, the uh, current density, which is the geometry of your instrument and how you're using it, flat versus a needle point, um, the dwell time, so how long you hold the button. If you keep the pedal to the metal, you cause a lot more um, desiccation and wider spread um, and more collateral damage. So you get, uh, so yes, yes, that's basically. And the tissue resistance, which I didn't um, discuss too much, but it can be increased um, by removing such, uh, such things as like blood or conductive fluid and um, increasing uh, tissue tension. So if you, if you, if you always, um, I always say that operating is controlling tension. You have to really see where you're operating. If your left hand is not producing the tension that you want, then your right hand is not gonna achieve the cutting effect that you need. Um, and so that's it. Now you've mastered the art of electrosurgery because the thermal effect on our tissue is dependent on the current over the area squared times resistance times time. Um, and with that, I'm gonna conclude. Thank you. And thank you for indulging me going over time. This is my email address. Thank you. All right, Kinga, before we let you go, let's get a couple questions in that are gonna nail down the answers on the FUSE test and really get at the major points. I think the most important point of your talk that we kind of fly by is that really high voltage, which is on the coag mode, that's what sets us up for all these stray energy complications that I think we're gonna talk about. There's five profiles of stray energy complications and it's really the high voltage on the coag mode that sets us up for these complications. Do you have any other comments on that? Because if you take the FUSE exam of the 72 questions, more than a dozen get at this concept that coag has a really high voltage which causes stray energy, whether it be capacitive coupling, through insulation failure, you know, through all these mechanisms, that voltage is an electromotive force that drives that electricity into places that's not desirable. Any comments on that, Kinga? Because I think that's probably the one most important point from your talk. Um, so yes, thank you. Um, basically, um, the main point is to use the lowest voltage possible. And what I just remember that um, the voltage is, yeah, like you said, the highest with the coag mode, lowest with the, uh, the cut mode. Um, and for, um, for sealing vessels, we use the cut, not the coag. Um, and uh, basically with um, setting that power on your ESU to higher numbers, you will increase the voltage, uh, especially if you it, it's um, uh, if you if you set it higher on the coag mode, the voltage will be even higher. That like if you set it at hundred on the coag mode and they set it at hundred on the cut mode, you will have a much higher voltage on the coag mode. Um, yeah. So great, and I just want everybody really to uh, sort of put that in your brain that coag delivers a really high voltage. And then the second part, as we pull up this next set of slides, there's five, I have in my mind, and King actually went over them in her last, her second to last slide. There's five things that you can do that are gonna change the clinical effect of the active electrode in the tissue. There's two on the generator, which is mode and the power setting. So the mode is the cut versus coag. We've got a little bit in the blend there, but your mode, and then your power setting, that's how many watts you set it at. Most people start at 30, 30 on adults. In pediatrics, you start much lower. And then there's three clinical things that you can do, right? So there's the dwell time, that's how long you're on the active electrode button. There's the current density, which is how much of the tip of the active electrode you're actually touching the tissue. The greater the uh, square area of the tip that you touch, the less heat you're gonna generate. And then the final thing is surgical technique, when you arc the energy over onto the tissue, on coag, that's called full duration. On cut, it's called vaporization. 
you're going to generate really high temperature. That's the highest temperatures when you do that, when you arc it over, right? When you hold it half a millimeter away from the tissue, you generate heat. And then there's desiccation when you actually stick the active electrode into the tissue or onto the tissue, you generate less heat, uh, but potentially you get a better hemostasis uh, to deeper structures that way. So Kinga, thank you. That was an excellent review. That's a dense one. That's the hardest one for everybody on the phone. Although I would say if you're, if you're gearing up for the fuse test, that's one we should be thinking about because the fuse test disproportionately has a lot of concepts from that first section on it. With that, we're gonna go to our next speaker who, uh, Fani is from Beth Israel Deakness Medical Center. And she is a recent medical graduate and in their research program. And she's part of the FUSE committee and really contributed when, when we were in Denver at the SAGES committee. And Fani, we are looking forward to you to put into clinical context what Kinga just explained to us from more in electrosurgery context. Absolutely, thanks so much. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm really happy to be part of this webinar today. So together we will talk about the use of surgical energy in everyday practice and also some key information that we need to have in mind. And as you see, I have kept the title of my presentation uh, more general. Uh, however, mo most things that I will be discussing today have to do um, mainly with the use of monopolar devices. So when using uh, electrosurgical devices, it is very helpful to know how they work. And we just heard a very comprehensive uh, presentation on the principles of elective surgery, but it is also very helpful to know how things might go wrong and also how to prevent, to prevent that. Uh, so during a procedure, there are mainly three mechanisms that an injury can occur. The injury can be related to the dispersive electrode, or it can be caused by a phenomenon called current diversion. Or lastly, uh, by the active electrode of the circuit, and we will talk. We will talk about um, e each one of these mechanisms in more detail right away. So, the first of all, the dispersive electrode. Uh, this is a, a part of, of the monopolar device circuits, and in order for it to function properly, it must be in uniform contact with a large surface area of tissue and the tissue has to be of low impedance. And this is why uh, we should, uh, in general, avoid pla places such as bony prominences or prosthesis, uh, scar tissue, or tissue with vascular compromise, uh, among others that you can see here, when deciding where to place the dispersive pad. Because if the dispersive electrode is not placed properly, we run the risk of having uneven current density throughout the application site an injury can occur. And here you can see pictures from two case reports where the patients uh, suffered burns at the site of the dispersive electrode. And this is something that we don't want to, ha we don't want to happen. Uh, next possible mechanism of injury is current diversion. Current diversion, uh, simply put, happens when the electrosurgical energy does not follow its designated path uh, let's say, throughout the circuit that we create. Um, there are four important things that fall under this category, so let's talk a bit more about them. First, we have insulation failure. Uh, this is a common cause of electrosurgical injury, especially during laparoscopic procedures. Just to remind you, uh, Kinga just uh, talked about that. Uh, current density is uh, inversely proportional to the surface area, and that means the smaller a break is, the higher the current density will be at that point. And we run the risk of uh, injury to nearby structures, um, like the bowel, for example, in the sketch. Uh, the newer devices are usually disposable and also uh, they have monitoring systems that can detect stray energy leaks. However, we should always be vigilant and uh, we should always very carefully inspect and test our instruments before use. Keep in mind that uh, breaks can sometimes be very small and uh, thus they can very easily uh, go unnoticed. Next, we have uh, direct coupling. And this is what happens when one of the conductive elements of our circuit, for example, a laparoscopic instrument, immediately touches or arcs to an element outside of the intended circuit. 
uh, direct coupling is often used deliberately, for example, to achieve coagulation. And I am pretty sure you have seen this or you have done this many times in your surgeries. Uh, the problem they arise when uh, the whole when uh, direct coupling occurs unintentionally because if the active electrode of our circuit touches an instrument, uh, that whole instrument can become electrified, and that energy might be directed towards non-target tissues and cause injury. Uh, the risk for such for such injury is uh, high in cases such as laparoscopic procedures where our instruments are not completely or not all the time in our field of view. Um, and what's more, uh, we have metal to metal arcing. Um, this is a subtype of direct coupling where the active electrode comes in contact with any metal, for example, the laparoscope, a clip or staples. And we should be extra careful to avoid such incidents, especially around staple lines, because on the one hand, they are metal uh, and they conduct current very well. And on the other hand, the, their surface area, uh, essentially the conducting area is very small. And this allows the current density and the temperature to increase dramatically. Uh, this is exactly what you can see uh, in these pictures. We had a staple uh, line there and simply touching our monopolar device on it had this very dramatic effect. Essentially we have a, a spark there. Another type of current diversion is capacitative coupling. What is a capacitator, you may ask? Uh, so in physics, a capacitator is an element of an electric circuit consisting of two conductors separated by an insulator. Uh, that's the definition. And this element can store energy. In this figure, for example, uh, you can see uh, a laparoscopic monopolar device, which is a conductor. And this device goes through a port that acts as an insulator. Uh, and capacitive coupling occurs uh, because the, the electromagnetic field around this uh, conductor, um, like this insulated device, can generate a current in a nearby conductor, another instrument, for example. In general, the risk of causing injury by capacitive coupling um, is higher when we use higher voltage or higher power settings um, when we activate an open circuit, when the electrode is not touching the tissue, for example, as well as when we activate our device over desiccated tissue because this tissue has higher impedance to current flow and it is easier for the energy to escape by capacitative coupling. Alternate side injuries uh, are another type of current diversion and they can occur anywhere on the patient's body, sometimes on multiple sites, uh, depending on uh, where the current flows essentially. Um, and to prevent this, it is uh, crucial to make sure that the patient is not in contact with anything that can potentially conduct current. In this case, the, the patient was in contact with these metal parts uh, uh, of the bed and uh, he suffered the thermal injuries that we can see. The third mechanism that uh, is important to be aware of in our clinical practice um, is injury related to the active electrode. And um, so inadvertent activation is a common cause of such injuries. And as the name implies, we have unintended, sometimes even unrecognized activation uh, of our electrosurgical device. And this can happen with any type of device. The risk of inadvertent activation is high when we use four more devices at the same time. And also uh, we need to be extra careful when performing laparoscopic procedures because unintended activation uh, can provoke injuries some, uh, sometimes outside of the field of view and they can go unnoticed and this is a problem. One very simple yet very useful precaution we should follow is to uh, return the instruments to a safe place when we don't use them, as we do when we replace the pencil in its holster, for example. Regarding injuries by uh, direct thermal extension, uh, it is easy to understand that this is an issue for structures that are anatomically in close proximity to one another. Um, 
as is the part of the duodenum adjacent to the gallbladder, or structures that are attached to one another um, by adhesion, for example. And lastly, residual heat is an issue related to ultrasonic devices mainly. And uh, it is important uh, that the surgeon make sure to allow for an adequate uh, cooling period before using them again. You will hear more about these devices later tonight. A good medical history is crucial, um, as is with any decision or treatment a doctor may provide. And in, in our case, it is necessary to know if the, a patient has any implantable devices, as many electrosurgical devices might interfere with them, especially monopolar devices. Uh, malnutrition, chronic steroid use, and conditions such as diabetes and cirrhosis are also very important to know because they might alter tissue impedance as well as other tissue characteristics and thus um, alter the effects that our uh, electrosurgical devices have on these tissues. And one last remark uh, on using electrosurgical energy uh, is that different rules may apply to pediatric patients and this uh, makes sense. So compared to adults, children have less total body surface area, and therefore there's a higher likelihood of injury from, from overlap of the surgical instruments that we use. Uh, children also have a greater total body water content, which means that their tissues have lower impedance and are good conductors of current. And finally, we uh, usually need smaller instruments uh, for infants and children. And increased current density from these smaller instruments may lead to more injuries. Uh, three general, general rules uh, that are good to follow are, one, uh, we should consider using bipolar uh, devices, not monopolar, monopolar devices when we have uh, this choice. Two, uh, we should always use the lowest possible energy setting. Um, that can give us the desired effect. And that goes for adults as well. And number three, we should uh, keep in mind that there are special considerations uh, regarding the use of dispersive electrodes in infants and children. And that brings us to the end of this uh, presentation. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, that was an excellent review. And I just want to stay on the phone if you can here for a second, just because we can pull Alejandro, you can start pulling up your slides, but let's, let's hit those topics that are asked on the FUSE test. I do think capacitive coupling is the number one outside question. And so the issue with capacitive coupling is you have intact insulation you're sending current down your active electrodes, you're sending electricity down the metal part in the middle of your active electrode. It goes across the intact insulation and it burns tissue that's adjacent to the shaft of the active electrode. So if they give us a question that you're doing the lap coli and there's a burn to the duodenal sweep or burn to the bowel, what they're talking about is the active electrode, the shaft of it lying adjacent to the duodenal sweep and um, burning the, that tissue. And there's a fairly famous New York Times article that went over that complication. Fani, if you had to say, which is the most clinically important of all those complication profiles you just presented, which one do you think it is? I'll give you my vote. There's no, there's no right answers here. Okay, that's good because uh, this is a tough question for me. And also, um, yeah, so you mean- so I'll give you my vote by far. Yeah, go ahead, please. The clinically important thing that you heard was insulation failures. If you go across, so we went across Denver 20, all of our stuff is 10 years old. 20% of laparoscopic instruments in major United States cities have one or more insulation defect. Up to one half of your robotic instruments that have all those joints have one or more insulation defects. When you go to Australia, there's a um, article out of Western Australia where 40% of laparoscopic instruments had one or more insulation defect. This is real. And if you touch that insulation defect to vulnerable tissue, vulnerable tissue would be the bowel. You are at high risk for burning it. And then so then we had direct coupling, which I think is important. Um, Fani put in the clinical context of burning a staple line. 
I think of it in my operating room, it's it's when you clip the, the bile duct and then you're using energy around those clips and you've either clipped the bile duct or you've clipped the cystic artery with, don't touch that clip because then all of a sudden you're gonna burn that tissue and you could get bleeding later. We're not gonna cover capacitive coupling again. Alternate site injuries I think are pretty rare these days. Although the alternate site injury that you did cover that I think is really important is inadvertent activations. Using a Bovi holster, it seems so simple, but my gosh, you can present, prevent so many burns by simply using the Bovi holster. Then you went over, I think the second most common, so I think insulation failure, actually that's not true. Direct application is number one. So we did an FDA, we did a study of 6,000 FDA reported elective surgery complications. We did this, I don't know, 2015. The number one reason that there was elective surgery complications was direct application. What that means is you're touching the tip of the active electrode to tissue and you're like closer to the bowel or closer than the ureter than you thought you would be. And you burn that tissue. And particularly when you're in the coag mode, what you do is you dry out the tissue and the tissue actually pulls towards your active electrode. Watch this when you're in the OR, the next time you're in the OR, you can see the tissue pulling towards your active electrode. So everybody should understand direct application. I think Alejandro is gonna teach us more about residual heat next, but we can talk about residual heat because I think that's a super important one with the ultrasonic device. And that is on the FUSE exam. Residual heat is greatest with the ultrasonic device. That's another question you can get right. And then Fana, you forgot my favorite, which is antenna coupling, but it's just my pet peeve. If you it look was back a... <laughs> at my study in Annals of Surgery, we published it in about 2013 or 14. It's actually in the operating room during lap coles. If you bundle your active electrode cord with the camera cord, you actually, electricity goes between the camera cord and the active electrode cord, and you can actually energize the cord of your camera. And so you don't wanna be bundling your cords in the operating room, but I'm not sure that's the most clinically important one. It's insulation failures and direct application. With that, let's go on to Alejandro. Alejandro, you are gonna teach us about tissue sealing devices uh, and really try to, I don't know if Alejandro is gonna use brand names, but you know, we throw around these brand names. We use like Coca-Cola instead of like pop or soda. And I think if we also kind of use a harmonic instead of like ultrasonic, right? And so Alejandro, can you teach us the difference between bipolar and ultrasonic so that we can understand that and use the right instrument? Pleasure. Uh, thank you for, for having me. So let's talk about mainly advanced bipolar devices and ultrasonic devices, also known as uh, tissue sealing devices. I have no disclosures and I put the slide up because of course I'm gonna mention some commercial names, uh, but I will really wanna stress that I have no relation to uh, any, any, any one company. All right, uh, so we've all been here in open surgery uh, where you're dealing with a blood vessel, could be as large as you know a short gastric, could be a small, as a small thyroidal uh, artery. Uh, but in open surgery, you know the drill, right? Uh, you ligate, you cut, and that's it. Uh, however, we all know the laparoscopic revolution of, of the 90s changed all that because up to then, uh, that was a practice that hadn't changed you know, much from uh, the early 20th century. Uh, you know, the, the old ligate, ligate cut uh, was something that, that, we, all, that we all did. Uh, and so, Laparoscopic surgery, I think, necessitated uh, an evolution of the technology. Both technologies, ultrasonic and, and bipolar, uh, predate the laparoscop laparoscopic uh, revolution uh, by, a by a long time. Uh, however, uh, new devices were definitely implemented um, in response to, to laparoscopy. So these are a couple of the most common ones we'll see, the, the, the harmonic or ultrasonic device. Uh, and the advanced bipolar or, uh, or famously called ligature device. Uh, and so instead of like it, like it cut, uh, you know, we just got uh, cauterized and, and cut. Uh, so this is an advanced bipolar device, I believe, uh, and it's going through those uh, short gastrics. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of the history, uh, like I said, and then I'm gonna go a little bit on the basic function and the use uh, of, of these de devices. Um, ultrasonic devices, I mean, the, the basic technology goes back to the 19th, 19th century uh, If uh, with Jacques Curie. If the name Curie rings a bell, yes, he's a brother-in-law of Marie Curie. Uh, he's a brother of Pierre Curie. Uh, and so Jackson and, and Pierre actually developed or discovered piezoelectricity, uh, which is essentially uh, the electricity that is 
derive when you apply a mechanical force to, to certain materials such as crystals, like famously like quartz. Um, and so this, I mean, this ancient, you know, discovery uh, actually translates into the, into the, to the device we use today, the, the ultrasonic device, because uh, this uses piezoelectricity to energize ceramic discs. And these are, uh, these ceramic discs are not on the device itself. They are uh, placed on, on, on the, uh, on the cord itself. Uh, I forget the name uh, of, of the cord. Uh, we, we call it the handpiece in Spanish. Uh, and so these are actually, these discs are actually in the handpiece and, and not on, on the disposable, on the disposable single use uh, device. Um, and so, sorry, before I go into the, into the, into the mechanism, the first uh, surgical application of piezoelectricity was actually with a device called the CUSA, uh, the, the Cavitron uh, aspirator, and, which was used. I, I found references at least dating back to the 50s. So uh, prior iterations of, these, of this, uh, of this uh, device uh, goes back a, a long time. Of course, as we know, you know, uh, with laparoscopy, we developed along uh, these, these new uh, devices. Uh, the way this works is essentially these uh, piezoelectric uh, energy will make these ceramic discs vibrate, and this will be directly translated into a single shaft or an oscillating jaw. And we have up here the, the passive articulated jaw. So this lower jaw uh, is the one that's going to stay hot, right? And so we're going to achieve our, our tissue effect, uh, be it coagulation or be it cutting, um, through a combination of, of vibration of essentially this uh, display oscillating back and forth, and also heating of the, of the tissue to temperatures that might exceed 100, 100 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, the ultrasonic, uh, I'm sorry, the more you, you press down, the less you will cut uh, the less you, the, the less you press down, uh, the less you will coagulate, right? Uh, so I guess if you want to use this device on, on, on a daily basis, you have to sort of get a feel for how much you want to press down and how much you want to lift, depending on, you know, the tissue effect. Am I cutting? Am I just, uh, am I cutting and coagulating or am I just coagulating, right? Uh, the, this device produces a third effect uh, called cavitation. Essentially, um, this will create a microenvironment where the the, the boil the the boil uh, the boil, uh, boiling uh, temperature will go down, um, and so the tissue surrounding it might produce might be expanded by uh, by gas produced by by uh, tissue evaporation, and so it's kind of subtle, but you can see here up on these last gastric vessels, as this device is activated, uh, cavitation causes this, this tissue here to sort of puff up. And so that uh, in theory makes uh, dissection a bit easier. In practice, I don't know, I've had bleeders uh, up here using ultrasonic device. Uh, so uh, dissection is, is easier, but it doesn't uh, keep you outside of, of trouble. One big point uh, that Tom touched on with ultrasonic devices is that this lower jaw uh, will stay hot for a good uh, few seconds after you stop activating it. So at least six, six, six seconds after you stop using it, uh, this will stay very hot and can actually injure, injure this, the, the tissue that it touches. So that's one big thing uh, that, uh, that you have to keep in mind when you use this device. Uh, I, I, I personally like to use it and I, I like uh, letting my residents use it and they do it uh, especially for this reason, uh, for them to get used to it and for them to, uh, to start using it because uh, if they don't, you know, the day they do, uh, they might cause an, an injury. So for example, for maybe uh, a, a lap appendectomy, uh, I will ask for an ultrasonic device and I'll let the, the resident handle this uh, and get a feel for it. Um, and sort of go through the basics of how this energy is working again, uh, because we don't want uh, unsafe surgery uh, going on. Uh, moving on to advanced bipolar de devices, uh, these trace their origins back to the original bipolar device. Uh, this was developed by another Jax, uh, Jackson Milrue, uh, a Canadian gynecologist. Um, 
And so this was developed for tubal ligations. Um, and so uh, Dr. Ryu noticed that he had a few patients with uh, unrecognized bowel injury after a tubal ligation where they applied uh, a monopolar uh, uh, device to the, to the, to the fallopian tubes. Um, and then by the injury mechanisms that uh, the other panelists have reviewed, uh, they, ha they, had, uh, they had bowel injuries. Uh, Dr. Ryu wasn't exactly uh, cognizant of the mechanism of injury, but he did know that there must be uh, straight energy uh, involved here. And so uh, the thought was, well, why can't we have energy going between, between, uh, between the tissue and not, you know, just between the target tissue and not through the rest of the, of the body. And so that led to the, to the development of, of the bipolar device. Uh, and advanced bipolar devices are newer iterations of this same, uh, this same technology. This will work much like your basic, uh, your, your, your basic uh, cutting setting in that it will produce a low voltage continuous wave, um, which will produce tissue evaporation, right? Uh, so we won't get as much desiccation, we will get uh, evaporate, uh, evaporation. When you apply this with a crushed uh, to tissue that is crushed between the, the bipolar clamp, then you, you get a, a good tissue seal. Uh, so you know that, that's a, the basic the, the basic functioning of it. Of course, uh, newer devices um, have other features. Mainly, uh, they have sensors for impedance. Uh, as, as as we reviewed before, impedance will be resistance to electrical flow. And so the higher the impedance, um, uh, we, we know that the tissue is done, is done, uh, uh, is, is done coagulating or, or evaporating. And so that lets the, that's that beep, beep, beep you hear when, uh, when the device senses that the cycle is done. Um, and the other feature that, that most of these uh, devices have is a, is a blade that runs through the middle because it's very hard to get a cutting effect uh, with, these, with, these, uh, with these bipolar devices. So you take uh, a long time to actually get that cutting. And so you crush it, you, you get your, your coagulation, uh, but then you also need your, your, your cutting. And so that's why they, they have these uh, plates that usually run uh, through the middle of, of, the, of the jaws. And so these are a few of the commonly, com commonly avert, available commercial names. Uh, harmonic sound incision for the for ultrasonic devices, um, the, for advanced bipolar, uh, there's ligature and sealed volant. Industry reps will chase you around and say, well, my device is better because so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. We'll go over that in a bit. Uh, there's another device called the Thunderbeat uh, made by a different company. Um, and this device actually combines both technologies. So this will uh, combine an ultrasonic shaft uh, and it will also be ready to, to deliver uh, bipolar uh, energy through the shaft and the other, the other passive jaw, which in this case isn't as passive. Um, the promise of this one is, it says, well, you can save time, right? Because uh, you, you can get good coagulation and you can get good cutting uh, and be more efficient in your, in your dissection, at least, you know, Again, that's what the, the industry promises. Um, I'm not dumping on industry. This is, I mean, honestly, uh, their development is good for us, right? If they make better devices, uh, we'll, we'll be, uh, we'll have uh, better, better operations, quicker operations uh, with a, a less bloody field. Um, but, you know, you always get the sense that everyone is telling you, well, my device is the best one because X, Y, and Z. Uh, and so all that said, which one should you choose? There are so many options out there in the, in the market, right? Uh, so there's a few studies that have looked at this. Well, not a few, there's a lot of them. Um, I, I just picked a few to, to highlight here. Uh, this group uh, by Apple White uh, looked at uh, Thunderbeat harmonic ver versus harmonic versus ligature. Uh, and they, use, they used the porcine module and they essentially activated all these devices on muscle on thyroid tissue, um, and they did a thyroidectomy on the pig uh, and on, and on uh, he hepatic uh, tissue. Um, and so essentially, uh, the temperatures were different. However, the heat transfer to the, to the tissue surrounding, surrounding them were similar. There were no significant differences. And all three devices were safe to use 
two millimeters away from the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, when they, 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 they move this to be one millimeter away to, to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, then they stop receiving a signal back uh, from this nerve. And so uh, the conclusion is that they're most of, mostly safe, uh, not 100% though, if you, if you stray too close to a vital structure such as the RLN. Um, uh, Lee in 2019 did an RCT uh, looking at the advanced uh, bipolar versus ultrasonic uh, device. Uh, these are open devices. Um, as you know, we've come full circle. The tech was pushed for laparoscopy and now we have the devices available uh, for open, open surgeries. Um, and so they looked at uh, bipolar uh, ligature essentially versus harmonic for um, for thyroidectomies, and they recruited 110 patients. They were able to evaluate evaluate 100 of them. Uh, the just distribution was 59, uh, sorry, uh, 51, 49, and, and again, same operative time, same drain volumes in in those patients that had drain uh, and say in comparable complications. So no discernible uh, differences, at least nothing statistically uh, significant. Um, and then finally, uh, this systematic review by Jansen, uh, this is a bit older, uh, and they were able to collect seven papers uh, out of their, their, uh, their, their, you know, their, their systematic review. Uh, these seven pa papers included 554 patients, and they compared advanced bipolar, bipolar versus ultrasonic uh, devices. Uh, once again, no difference in blood loss, no difference in operative time, no, no difference in complications. They could not make, uh, they set out to make a cost uh, difference analysis, but they didn't find any papers that uh, actually mentioned this. So um, that, that's, that, that, that question was, was, uh, was left open. And so I would say uh, for take home points, uh, you have to know the technology you're, you're using. Uh, if these devices are, are new um, and they, you know, they're, they're not reprocessed, et cetera. They should work well. If you know what you're doing, if you, if you, if, you, if you're using them correctly, uh, you're going to get a, the, the right tissue effect, uh, which one you're going to use. Well, again, you got to ask yourself, which tissue effect am I, am I looking for? Uh, so I would, uh, which one to choose, you know, use the one that works for you. Use the one that you have in your institution, uh, learn to work with it. Uh, because I know some institutions have particular contracts with certain providers. So. Um, I would say, you know, uh, I wouldn't get too married to a certain tech, just use what, uh, what works uh, for you. Uh, and finally, why, you, why should you know the tech? Well, you don't want to be this surgeon. Uh, you don't want to activate uh, this ultrasonic shear and immediately push down on the duodenum. Uh, that's something, you know, this is just asking for trouble, right? Uh, because again, this ultrasonic, uh, the, the, the active uh, shaft will stay hot for a few seconds. And so just activate it and then pushing it down on any structure, you know, but I know the duodenum is especially scary, uh, is, is a big no-no. Thank you. Okay, Alejandro, let's, can we go over a couple of questions while Kitaro pulls up his slides? So which operations do you use an ultrasonic device on and which operations do you use in advanced bipolar? Do you have specific practice patterns? Uh, I use ultrasonic for abdominal mostly. Uh, I don't do a lot of uh, lower, I don't do a lot of hindgut, uh, but uh, for foregut, uh, short gastrics, et cetera, I, I'll use an ultrasonic. Uh, for lap babies, I'll use an ultrasonic. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, for curious reasons, uh, for if I'm doing, say, a thyroidectomy, uh, just because of how it feels and how it handles, I, I prefer the, uh, the advanced bipolar. And device. Right. So there's a real art to using these devices. And, and so everybody should get both types in their hand. And I just want to go over the fundamental characteristics of these two devices again. I asked a question there. I said, I'm surprised it went radio silent. It's which device passes electrical current between the jaws. That's the advanced bipolar, right? The bipolar device is actually passing bipolar. current or electricity between the two jaws. Now, when we think about this electricity, it's an enormously low, low, low voltage current that's going across there. So we talked about, Kinga taught us that 30 watts coag has 9,000 volts, right? High voltage sets us up for stray energy. If you do 30 watts 
cut, right, versus coag, it's 1,000. So if you go from coag, which is 9,000, to cut, which is 1,000, the advanced bipolar, um, when we were measuring this a while ago, it was about 120 volts. And so super low voltage, high, high current. So current is the flow of electrons. Voltage is the electromotive force that kind of pushes them through the circuit. When the electromotive force is high, your risk for it becoming straight current and getting injuries. So that's the advanced bipolar. Now let's just for a second before we start with this, you can go ahead and pull up your slide set for the implantable devices. So when we talk about the ultrasonic device, right? This is, we have, it's, it's a vibration. So you have the piezoelectric electrode that plugs into the back of the handpiece. And if you ever notice the person, the scrub tech or the nurse who's setting up your instrument, they actually have to tighten it to a certain tightening. They use this little tightening device. And that's because you're seeding the extending rod into the piezoelectric electrode to make that extending rod vibrate. What Fuse, Fuse is gonna ask you a thousand times, when you change between settings, typically it's three and five or the two settings that, that you use on the ultrasonic device, you're not changing the frequency of the vibration. It's always 55,500 times. There used to be a device that was half that and they took it off the market. And so you can say it's 55,500 times a second it's vibrating. The difference between three and five is the distance it vibrates. So when you're on five, it vibrates 100 microns. And when you're on three, it vibrates 70 microns. So when, if you think of a saw and you do the saw a long distance at the same speed, you're gonna cut through the wood a lot quicker. So five at 100 microns dispersion, you know, it goes, that's how far it goes, goes much quicker through the tissue, but gets poor hemostasis. It's a vibration. So don't, think that the ultrasonic device is passing electricity through the current. It's not, it's through the tissue, it's vibrating. You understand the concepts I just got at, I think you get the questions in the fuse exam, right? And then the last question for you, Alejandro, help me understand how big a blood vessel I can take with each one of these instruments, because the fuse exam kind of gets at this. Sure, uh, essentially up to seven, eight millimeters, is that right? Uh, the ultrasonic, that used to be the weakness of the ultrasonic device, but then a few years back, they. Uh, they put up this new product and they actually uh, named it, you know, seven plus, right? To reflect that change that you can get bigger, uh, bigger blood vessels. Great. So we need to be, yeah. And then this, so you need to, Alejandro's in Mexico, but here you need to be reading this FDA package insert. And you think to yourself, I never read that. Well, you probably should eyeball that if you're going to use an instrument over and over and they'll be rated up to a certain millimeter vessel. The original ultrasonic devices were up to three millimeters. Now they're up to seven millimeters. The majority of the advanced bipolar devices are seven millimeters. And so I think that, that that's probably a good answer. That exact number isn't on the fuse exam, but getting at the different sizes of blood vessel is probably a reasonable thing. And then the last question that the fuse exam really gets you on is residual heat. The ultrasonic device gets super, super hot, the ultrasonic device. So you can't touch tissue right after you activate it because that, where the extending rod sticks out, that extending rod is really, really hot. Okay, with that, let's go. Thanks, Alejandro. I totally appreciate it. Alejandro, let's, or, or Kitaro, let's talk about implanted cardiac devices. So what an implanted cardiac device is like a pacemaker or a defibrillator. And like nobody kind of knows what to do when you show up in the middle of the night uh, with an urgent patient who has, other than throw a magnet on it, right? And so Maybe, Katara, you can help us understand what we should really do is if, if we have a patient, we want to use electrosurgery in the setting of a pacemaker. Sure. Can everybody hear me and see the slides? Yep. We can hear you and we can see the slides. All right. Perfect. So I'm Kay Nakamoto. I'm a acute care surgeon at MedStar Baltimore, and I'll be talking about surgical energy use in the setting of implanted cardiac devices. So the modern era, there are many implantable devices. Today, we're going to be talking about the cardiac implantable electronic devices, or CIEDs. As Dr. Robinson kind of alluded to, there's pacemakers and there's implantable defibrillators, or ICDs. You can actually tell the difference between these two on the chest x-rays, and it's kind of important for my talk as well. Uh, the, these ICDs have leads that have thick coils on them, whereas the pacemakers do not. There's actually an app called the Pacemaker ID app, uh, that allows you to take pictures of patients' chest x-rays and it identifies using AI technology what exact, you know, if it's an ICD or pacemaker, what brand of pacemaker the patient has actually. So that may be useful for some people. 
obviously the number of pacemakers people have have been increasing. There were 3 million patients with conventional paces in the US and about 750,000 pacemakers are implanted in the US yearly. There are over 300,000 patients with ICDs also. So you need to be cognizant of you know, people with pacemakers that you're using surgical energy devices on. EMI is electromagnetic interference and it can be emitted from multiple devices that you use in the surgical uh, theater. The most common one is monopole electrical surgical devices that are Bobe. Other things that are interesting, you know, RFA, uh, even things like electrocardiographic monitors, fluid and blood warmers. The most interesting one for me was the radio frequency scanner or the uh, so-called wand that we used to detect retained foreign surgical items can even uh, emit uh, EMIs. So what are the potential effects of EMIs on cardiac implanted electrical devices? The most important one is uh, inappropriate inhibition of pacing due to ventricular oversensing. So ventricular oversensing is when the pacemaker senses electrical signals, such as from the Bovi, that should be ignored and instead interprets these signals as native R waves, resulting in no pacing generated by pacemaker. So this can result in profound bradycardia or asystole in a pacing dependent patient. It can also cause misinterpretation of EMI as a tachyarrhythmia, resulting in delivery of inappropriate shocks by an ICD. I think these two are the main uh, things that are important. The other, other things that uh, EMI can do to CIEDs, it can cause direct damage to the CIED, causing malfunction and reprogramming, or the EMI conducted can be conducted by the lead inducing VF or AF. Also the thermal injury, it can cause thermal injury at lead tissue interfaces, but uh, these are less often, uh, happen less often with the uh, modern CIEDs. How often does this happen? So how often does EMI interfere with CIEDs? So obviously the further away the device is from the electrosurgical instrument, the lower the risk of EMI. So one study showed clinical significant EMI that would have led to delivery of shock by an ICD was seen in 7% of surgeries during non-cardiac surgery above the umbilicus. 29% in intrathoracic surgery, which is obviously closer usually to the CIED devices. Uh, but what's interesting is it was only seen in 0% was seen in 0 in surgery below the umbilicus. So maybe if we're operating on you know, tissues below the umbilicus, you don't have to be too worried about you know, EMI interfering with CIEDs. This is an example of ventricular oversensing like we talked about. This is when the EMI from the BOVI is interpreted as native activity by the pacemaker. So you can see on the ECG, the only spikes, which is probably the BOVI, uh, and this causes, you know, this is sensed by the pacemaker, which thinks it's, it's a native, native activity, and it completely inhibits the pacemaking function of the pacemaker. And as you can see it in the art line, this guy has no pulse for, for quite a long time. Note that the ECG is not very reliable. And also realize that, you know, when you're using BOVI or monopolar electrical surgery on patients with CIEDs, make sure you use them in short bursts. If this patient had gotten the bovi used for a longer period of time, you know, his pacemaker would have sensed it and would have, wouldn't have delivered a pacing uh, for a longer, even a longer period of time, possibly leading to asystole. This is kind of, I apologize for a small font, but I kind of wanted to put it all in one slide. But this is probably the most important slide of the uh, presentation. So what can you do to prevent harmful EMI effects on CIED? Two things, you can either reprogram the CIED and you have to have a, you have to follow intraoperative precautions. Reprogram, you can do it these, this in uh, two ways. You can use a magnet or more, more formally, you can ask the cardiologist to do a pacemaker ICD interrogation. The magnet usually defaults these uh, pacemakers to asynchronous pacing at a set rate. And for ICDs, it suspends tachyarrhythmia therapy. The more formal interrogation by the cardiology team Usually you can figure out what exact settings the pacemaker is set at and can adjust the settings accordingly. The intraoperative precautions you have to follow is try to use bipolar and ultrasonic devices instead of monopolar Bovi devices when possible. Position the dispersive electrode as close as possible to the tool or the active electrode. Try to make, this, make sure that the current path is away from the implanted device. Use cut over coag. Use the lowest feasible energy levels. Use short intermittent bursts like we talked about. Don't arc and uh, have a defibrillator and temporary pacing equipment available in the OR. 
let's get into detail about what a magnet does. For, for a pacemaker, a magnet often results in asynchronous mode, but it varies by manufacturer. So this is the scary part. And it can be affected by remaining battery life. For an ICD, it actually does not usually alter the pacing function. It often disables the tachyarrhythmia therapy. And one cautionary uh, tale is that it may permanently disable tachyarrhythmia therapy. So you've got to be, be cognizant of that too. Magnet morph pacemakers. So this is for pacemakers, but a magnet application over a pacemaker results in a closing of a reed switch or triggering of a Hall effect sensor. A reed switch is just an electrical switch operated by an applied magnetic field. And a Hall effect sensor is a type of sensor that detects the presence and magnitude of a magnetic field. By default programming, which is important again, magnet application results in asynchronous pacing at a set rate in most, but not all pacemakers. So asynchronous pacing is a mode in which the pulse generator delivers a pacing stimulus at a fixed rate, regardless and without any sensing capabilities. So regardless, if, if you have EMI affecting the CIED, the pacer doesn't sense that when they're in asynchronous mode and continues to deliver a set rate of pacing. Again, like we said, uh, this does not apply to, it applies to most, but not all pacemakers. And depending on the brand of pacemaker and the type of pacemaker, uh, the default settings differ. So you really have to know what, what exactly the pacemaker is going to default to when you put the magnet on. Uh, but although usually most of the time it defaults to an asynchronous continuous set rate. For ICDs, it's different. And that's why we talked about in the beginning, you have to kind of be cognizant of whether patient your patient has an ICD or a pacemaker. Magnet application on an ICD will suspend tachyarrhythmic detection and therapy, but has no effect on the pacing mode. So suspending tachyarrhythmic detection and therapy is important because the EMI could be you know, misinterpreted as a tachyarrhythmia and, can and the ICD can deliver a shock. But you know, as you all, you all know, ICD is a pacemaker function and the magnet will not affect the pacing mode. So the pacing dependent patient it can result in profound bradycardio asystole, uh, especially if the, if the by uh, EMI uh, inhibiting the pacer. IC response to magnets also differ, uh, differ depending on the device also, as seen in this table. And most ICDs have no effect on pacing with a magnet, whereas the effect on tachycardia therapy uh, is dependable, but most of them disables it. So disadvantages of magnets, and obviously, you know, you may not know what the device setting it may default, default to if you put a magnet on. Also, these patients, the patients with deep placement of CIDs may fail to elicit a response to a magnet. Sometimes you can stack magnets, or stack two of them uh, to increase the, mag uh, the magnetic field. Uh, it may be difficult to maintain magnets in a stable position, depending on patient positioning, like if you wanted to position a patient prone or in lateral decubitus position. Also may jeopardize the sterility of the field, and magnet-induced asynchronous pacing can also compromise cardiac function depending on the patient, cause competition between the pacemaker and the patient's intrinsic rate, and cause things like R on T phenomenon, which can result in a, a fatal arrhythmia. So still, magnets have many disadvantages, and the gold standard is usually to interrogate the pacemaker. The disadvantage of this is that you have to get the cardiology team to do it for you. Uh, depending on your institution, that can delay your surgery. Uh, but this still uh, is more detailed. You know, you can interrogate it so you know exactly what pacemaker settings the patient has, and you can default it, you can change the default settings uh, appropriately for a patient for when you do surgery. Magnet versus interrogation. Uh, like we said, uh, advisories and expert opinion caution against routine magnet use and an appropriate preoperative consultation and preparation with CIED interrogation should be performed when feasible. Just briefly talk about uh, intraoperative prevention. So this, uh, uh, this study uh, basically showed less EMI when there's decreased generator power used, 30 watts versus 60 watts. Cut mode was used versus coag mode. Desiccation technique was used instead of fulguration. And I'll uh, review this, but desiccation technique is when the bovi tip is actually touch touching the uh, target tissue. When it's fulguration, it was in the bovi tip is kind of hovering over it and letting it arc. Orienting the active electrode cord from the feet rather than across the chest wall. Now, this is interesting because, you know, like we talked about the antenna effect, 
and electrical, the Bowie cord actually emits EMI. So you don't want it traversing the chest wall. So you want the Bowie machine towards the feet and the Bowie uh, cord coming from the feet rather than across the chest wall. Avoiding the current path from crossing the CIED system and increasing the distance from active electrode to CIED system. This is the current path. It's basically the path between the active electrode and the dispersive electrode. You don't want that to pass uh, over to CIED. Lastly, post-operative interrogation. This is important. Uh, patients need to be monitored continuously until interrogated post-operatively, especially in high-risk patients. A transcutaneous pacer or defibrillator patch should be left in place. And why do this? It's because some patients may need adjustments from the original settings after surgery due to hemodynamic instability or the change in the patient condition. There can be also damage at lead tissue interfaces. The EMI may have inadvertently reprogrammed the CIED, and magnets can occasionally permanently disable anti attack arrhythmia therapies and ICDs. So there are different perioperative CIED advisories uh, published by the American Society of Anesthesia, Heart Rhythm Society, Canadian Societies, and British Societies. And all of them basically recommend if you're going through an elective surgery, uh, try to get your pacemaker interrogated and adjusted uh, you know, several months before the surgery. If it's an emergency surgery, they recommend considering magnets to produce asynchronous pacing for pacemakers if pacemaker dependent and considering a magnet for ICDs to suspend ICD tachyrhythmia therapy. They also recommend cardiac monitoring until post-operative interrogation, like we just talked about. So in summary, and I apologize again for a small font, uh, seven, there's a 7% 7 risk of clinically significant EMI if working above the umbilicus, now, up to 30% if, if intrathoracic. This EMI can cause bradycardia or asystole in pacemaker-dependent patients with a pacemaker or inappropriate shock in patients with ICDs. What you can do is you can reprogram the CIEDs, especially for operating above the umbilicus, and you can do that either with a magnet or a more formal pacemaker slash ICD interrogation by a cardiologist team. Intraoperatively, you need to follow these precautions. Try to use bipolar or ultrasonic devices as much as possible. Position the dispersive electrode as close as possible to the active electrode or the tool. Divert the current path away from the CIED. Use cut over coag as much as possible. Use the lowest feasible energy levels and use short intermittent bursts. Also, don't arc. Always have a defibrillator and temporary pacing equipment available. And don't forget to consider post operative interrogation of the uh, CIED. That's it. Thank you. That's a great review. So can you just help me with a couple of questions while we pull up? So who's next? Hung, you're next, Hung Trong. Um, so Katara, if you're in the middle of the night and you have an operation, either an appendicitis or like an incarcerated inguinal hernia, something below the belly button, and somebody's got a implanted defibrillator, how do you recommend managing that? So to be safe, I'd always have a uh, defibrillator in the operating room as well as a pacer. But if it's up under the beneath inferior to the umbilicus, as you know, shown in that study, there's very, very little uh, chance risk of triggering some sort of adverse event with the CIED. As long as you follow those intraoperative precautions, you know, namely positioning the bovi below on the foot, make sure the bovi cord is coming toward from the foot, uh, bovi pad, you know, make sure the current path isn't traversing the CIED, etc. I don't think we need to put a magnet on this patient. Okay. And so if you're below the umbilicus, you're safe. What if you're doing a lap coli? And so you're using the monopolar instrument on 30 watts coag and you're up in the gallbladder fossa. What do you recommend um, the team do? You're on a Saturday, so you can't call the EP, the electrophysiology nurse. So in these patients, you know, you assess whether or not the patient, you know, is pacemaker dependent or not. If the patient is pacemaker dependent as a pacemaker, I would put a magnet on. Great. All right, so I just want to highlight a few points so we can get all the questions correct on the FUSE exam. Um, I first of all want to recognize, so Kitaro pointed out uh, one of the manuscripts, that Jack's article from 2014, one of the giants of um, electrosurgery with cardiac devices, Mark Rosner, who is now deceased. So we recognize Mark Rosner. He was one of the original FUSE committee members. 
but he flew up here to Denver to help us do. We really worked for, for two days. I think Pascal was on that call also came in. A bunch of people came in and we did that very intensive study. And what we really focused on were the modifiable factors that you can affect as a surgeon. And these actually are the questions that get on the FUSE exam. So let me just go over these so we can get all the questions correct. Um, so the first one is you need to modify whatever surgical energy device you're using to have the lowest voltage possible. So if you use an ultrasonic device, which vibrates, right? You don't have any electricity in the patient, like that's the best. Advanced bipolar has like 120 volts. That's almost nothing. And the current just passes between the, the jaws of the instrument. Um, but if you're using the monopolar instrument, so that's the Bovi, right? We wanna be using cut, the lower voltage, cut mode versus coag, which is higher voltage. We want to use, be using the, the technique of desiccation because when you desiccate or touch the tip of the instrument to the tissue, you decrease the voltage that's coming out of that generator. All those concepts are on the fuse exam. Second one is you got to route your current vector in the right way. So if you do an inguinal hernia, but you put the dispersive electrode up on the shoulder so that the, the current passes from the inguinal hernia up through the cardiac implanted device through the shoulder, right? That, that doesn't do any good. You want to put the dispersive electrode so the current goes through the body away from the um, cardiac implanted device. And so a great example of this is if you're doing a melanoma on the upper extremity, right? That's right next to a cardiac implanted device. If you just put your dispersive electrode down next to the hand and the current goes down towards the hand, you're totally safe because right, you're, you're, you're not gonna run the current through that device. Great concept. So current vector, where you put the dispersive electrode, you can't change where the operation is, but you can change where your grounding pad is, quote unquote. The next one is distance from the cardiac implanted uh, device. You know, we can't really control that, right? Because the anatomy of the dissection is kind of fixed. But what I would say to the team on the phone is, don't think of the cardiac implanted device as the generator that's in the chest wall, right? The tips that actually sense electricity are, are literally screwed into the wall, into the myocardium, into the wall of the heart. So you need to think of where you are in the proximity, not only to that fixed generator, but also the tips of the lead that are down in the heart. And it is true, once you're about 10 centimeters away, we couldn't make the electromagnetic interference any greater than just the ambient level of the room once we were 10 centimeters away, as long as we were routing the current vector or putting the dispersive electrodes of the current went away from the, um, uh, from the cardiac implanted device. And then the final concept that you got at that was nice is if you're doing an inguinal hernia and you put your dispersive electrode down on the buttock, but you, you drape your cords across the chest, you're gonna have a ton of electromagnetic interference because those cords are radiating electromagnetic interference. Think of it like when you walk under high wires and you can hear that buzz of the high wires. And the active electrode has an equivalent amount as the dispersive electrode, right? The same amount of voltage and current is going through the active and dispersive electrode. Both those cords need to be coming from the feet, need to be away from the cardiac implanted device. Okay, if you understand those, I think you're gonna bat 100% on the fuse questions. And now we're gonna move on to Hung Trong and Hung is in Hawaii. Is that true? Are you in Hawaii right now? No, I'm actually not in Hawaii. I'm um, currently in San Diego working for the Scripps uh, Medical Clinic. Oh, somehow I had a Hawaii email for you. All right, well, I thought that would be fun. Um, but listen, so what we're gonna learn about next is we're gonna talk about operating room fires. And so that's a never event. We should never light a patient or a team member burn them with a fire. And if you can understand the fire triangle and some of the critical uh, concepts, we can avoid fires. So Hung, why don't you take it away? Great. So um, hello, everyone. My name is Hung Tron, as uh, we were just mentioning. So the, the, the presentation I have is in regards to operating room fires and do our team actually know how to safely respond to one, have no disclosures. So just a background information, all our fires are pretty devastating, never events, happens about two to three times that results in patient death per year, at least from the data I've looked at. And there's increasing surgical liability claims um, that's you know, gone from less than 1% in the late 1980s to now over, almost 5% when you're looking at information around 2000, 2009. So when do OR fires occur? Um, they often occur in 
uh, the upper torso area. So 21% of it occurs in the airway during airway procedures, 44% of it occurs around the head, neck, face, and upper chest. Usually happens uh, often with an open oxygen source when it's present and when local oxygen concentration is above 30%. So ventilated and, uh, patients and also patients who are getting oxygen supplementation. But it also does occur during alcohol-based skin prep um, that's pulled and, and there's an addiction source as well as other uh, sources such as laparoscopic and endoscopic light sources when it touches the drape. And some of what you guys are practicing of what you guys are already um, are aware of, but those, these are kind of the, the common causes. So just a quick chart showing the annual increases in incidence of surgical fires that are being reported to FDA. So there's an increasing trend throughout the years. So how did we um, as surgeons and societies respond to it? So a fair amount of different societies did create different practice patterns and the advisories for um, OR fires. So the American Society of Anesthesiology um, the Joint Commission and the FDA, also Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation created different resources that uh, are included down below. And the uh, Society of AORN also introduced a fire safety uh, toolkit and also a risk assessment checklist and instructions on how to put out over fires. Um, actually, our hospital uses something very similar and I'm pretty sure that other hospital systems to use the same thing, such as a fire risk assessment before the start of the procedure, um, communicating the assessment between the team members during timeout, and also documenting the assessment during patient records. Um, but more uh, noteworthy is that SAGES also developed FUSE, uh, of which is this, this presentation. It's a curriculum-based program with online didactic modules to uh, inform us on safe usage of energy-based devices, such as our previous presenters have discussed, but also included OR fire safety and prevention. So understanding OR fires, one key emphasis is the, OR, uh, the fire triangle. And why is this important? It's because you need all three sides or sources to start an OR fire. And if you keep the components away from each other, this helps prevent it. So the three main sides of the triangle is the fuel source, which is, as I mentioned before, alcohol, skin preps, uh, things that can catch on fire, such as drapes, gowns, gauzes, flammable material, uh, patient skin, um, hair and skin, stuff of which we can control from a nursing and a, and a you know, surgical aspect. And then the emission source, so things that we've talked about, about before, the ESU, the different sources of um, energy sources, fiber optic sources, uh, devices, et cetera, and then the oxidizers. So in order for a fire to start, you would actually need a, a fuel. And oftentimes what really helps it is the oxygen, as we mentioned before, from the anesthesia side, as well as the different gases as well. So the scenarios that increase fire risk. So as I mentioned uh, a little bit before, pulling of the alcohol-based skin preps is a high risk for all our fires. And so, that's why we have a, the occasional three minute timeout before cases and after prep, uh, prepping these uh, alcohol-based skin preps to allow drying. Um, and a few misconceptions that we wanna make sure we emphasize is that surgical drapes, as I mentioned before, during a, um, in the fire triangle is they, they can actually catch on fire. So that's a false statement that it doesn't. And non-alcohol skin prep is flammable, which is false. So the betadine solutions, et cetera. So what happens when an OR fire occurs and how do we respond to it? And these are some very important key steps. Uh, one, make sure we stop flow of all airway gases to patients. So disconnect the breathing circuit, uh, which reduces one of the fire uh, triangle uh, arms. Um, OR fires, uh, oh, sorry, for airway fires, make sure you disconnect the breathing circuit from the tube, remove the ET tube and pour saline in the airway. Uh, because the fire can still persist within that um, area. Remove all burning and burn mat uh, materials from the patient, so the drapes, et cetera, if possible, in a safe manner. 
and then obviously extinguish the fire on the burning material. Um, not all OR fires, uh, so ORs have CO2 fire extinguishers, so we can use different types of materials such as water, uh, but also be aware of the resources you have in your OR. So next time around when you're in the operating room, uh, make sure you identify where all the different um, things such as the extingu fire extinguishers are at so that you can actually use it when it's necessary. And then afterwards, after the fire has been put away, obviously to care for the patient, restore breathing and address the different uh, injuries that has occurred. So a few examples, obviously, if it's a very small fire, say from a bovi or um, you know, electro collar unit or uh, a uh, fiber optic cable, uh, make sure you just pat, that, pat it out with, with something that uh, can prevent it from burning. And if it's a large fire, you know, make sure you rip off the grapes to, to prevent the fire from entering the patient and, and uh, other important um, things. And then what are the steps for immediate response? So in the healthcare setting, the acronym is RACE. So one, rescue, uh, attempt to rescue the patient from the fires, which, which we've talked about before. Then alarm, which is alert the staff, the OR team, um, the fire department, activate the fire alarm system, and then confine. So isolate the room, close off the doors, make sure that we can contain the fire that still persists, and then eventually evacuate to leave the room um, to a safer area. So prevention and management. Some key points is one, obviously, how do we learn more and also train to address and prevent all our fires? Uh, discuss fire risks at team briefings can actually help kind of prepare the team for when an event does occur. And for high risk cases, make sure that you have different sources of ways to put out our fires. So wet sponges, sterile water, uh, saline if, for, uh, if available for the back table, and also syringes for um, oral procedures or areas that are more difficult to, to, to reach if there was an OR fire that occurs. And if there is a high risk case, make sure that we avoid confining oxygen in the drape. So making sure that the oxygen levels don't accumulate in different types of compartments around the, the drapes, especially around the anesthesia side um, to prevent one of the ignition sources that can cause an OR fire. Again, OR fires are relatively uncommon. They're never events as we just mentioned. And one way to really help improve our preparedness for all our fires is simulation training, of which we know do help transfer skills to real world settings, especially in uncommon never events. And also we've known that hands-on bench top training, in addition to didactic materials, do help improve learning and retention um, of the knowledge, such as the, the Sages Fuse curriculum. Different types of training and preparedness modules is one is the high fidelity simulation training. So as I mentioned before, we, we can actually have a, a multidisciplinary team of active clinical staff members, surgeons, anesthesiologists, nursing staff, and we can put the crew through a, a very um, you know, validated, stimulated uh, simulation training module. Um, but as you can see in the picture, it does can be quite costly and difficult because we're using up a, a space for training and, and also the, the amount of resources, materials needed to, to put things, uh, something like this together. And other sources are something that just, you know, we've, we've been working on with the FUSE curriculum for years is that we can use a validated virtual reality simulation team training uh, based off the FUSE curriculum with and without artificial intelligence to really prepare us for simulation training. And that's pretty much it for, for my part. Thank you, that was great. I, I think I've been jabbering too much. I just looked at the time. So we're gonna get Sharon on hung. But so Sharon, you load up your slides and while you do, if you're gonna get the correct on the fuse exam, know your fire triangle, those three sides of the fire triangle. And the first, um, so you have to unshare your screen hung and then I think Sharon can share hers. Okay. 
Gotcha. And then the second thing is you should, if you have an airway fire, the first thing you should do is extubate. So it's not disconnected, it's extubate, which while there may be some debate about that, actually, that is the right answer. Um, and so you'll get the few things right. Okay, Sharon Bachman, who comes to us from uh, Virginia, is and a longtime FUSE member is going to teach us. This is the latest part of the FUSE curriculum, which is on surgical smoke and aerosolization. We kind of created it uh, with the COVID pandemic. Um, and Sharon, you want to take it away and, and, and wind it up for the FUSE program here? Sure. Tom, can you see my slide full screen okay? Yep. Great. So good evening, everybody. I understand I'm probably the only thing between you and at least on the East Coast going to bed. So we will try to make this efficient. Um, I just want to acknowledge Dean Makami, who's another FUSE committee member who put together the bulk of these slides and they are great, as you will see. I have nothing to disclose. Um, so what, why is surgical smoke and aerosolization important? I think everyone here who's a surgeon has had that first whiff of the bovi in the morning. <laughs> and um, what we don't think about is what is in that smoke? W what are we inhaling? So surgical smoke actually contains over 150 different kinds of chemicals. Um, that includes toxic gases, vapors. I don't think many of us think about breathing in cyanide for breakfast in the morning, but that's in smoke. Can have dead and live cellular material and you can have irritation from that in the respiratory tract. So I know we all try to live pretty healthy lives, we're physicians, but operating room smoke can give you the same exposure to 27 to 30 unfiltered cigarettes daily, especially if you are a high electrosurgery uh, pencil user. And about half a million of us are exposed to electrical surgical smoke every year. So this is not a small number. So just some of the risks with that exposure, symptoms can include hypoxia and dizziness, um, irritation of the eyes, your oropharynx, nausea and vomiting, weakness and headaches, and you can have actual disease like emphysema, asthma, bronchitis, uh, anemia and leukemia sound pretty bad, viral transmission like hepatitis, all of these things are not great. So other things that are in the aerosolized smoke. And if you look at the little picture, you can see some of the very toxic things that burn in a cigarette and probably also burn from our patients. But, you know, we think about our exposure, the patient is also potentially exposed unless they're on a closed circuit. And that could give you false pulse ox readings. Um, if you've got methemoglobin formation, or they could have low oxygen levels for real, if there's carbon monoxide bound to oxygen or carboxyhemoglobin. Um, also, if we think about aerosolization and there's metastatic, um, or sorry, if there's um, cancerous cells, you could potentially have port site metastases. I have a surgical oncology partner, and even though we don't think about it a lot, she sees it not infrequently. So we're going to talk about some of the different ways of mitigating the risk of surgical smoke in the further slides. But just to talk about the brass tacks of, of the particulate matter that's in smoke. So the ultrasonic scalpel actually makes some of the larger particles that's anywhere from 0.35 to 6.5 microns. That's relatively big. And some of those can get trapped in the upper respiratory tract. But as it gets smaller and smaller, so as we see lasers, which have particulate matter of 0.31 microns, and our electrosurgical hand pieces down to 0.07 microns, those are going all the way down into the parenchyma of the lung. There's really not much there to stop it. So the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health has what's called a hierarchy of controls. And in this graphic, you can see there's five greater categories to help mitigate risk. It's an inverted period because the top is the most effective and the bottom is the least effective. Unfortunately, the bottom is the one that we tend to have the most effect over. But we're going to talk a little bit about what some of these different mitigation strategies are. And elimination is the hardest because that's really the architecture of your OR and, and fixing that can involve some really um, big renovations if you don't have adequate machinery. Substitution can be things like positive negative pressure rooms or replacing the hazard, but if your patient's the hazard, then that's hard to replace. We try to keep 
people out of the OR who don't need to be there that isolates them from the hazard. And we try to change the way people work to mitigate like this uh, webinar tonight. And then finally, we'll talk about personal protective equipment. So filtration is one of the primary modes that we have for mitigation. Um, and that's a physical barrier to the smoke and, and the potential sources of infection and gas. All of us are now painfully familiar, I think, with N95 respirators. And interestingly, they're designed to filter out 95% of the particles that are 0.3 microns and larger. As we get to some of the COVID slides, keep that number in mind, 0.3 microns. Most people are also familiar with high, efficiently, high efficiency particulate filters, so HEPA filters, which can um, filter out 99.9% .9 of particles of that size, 0.3 microns. And then the ultra low particulate air filters are almost 100% efficient in removing particles that are 0.12 microns. So for the top of that pyramid, this is really interesting because I hadn't really thought about this previously, but our ORs are, are mandated to have specific ventilation. And for an OR to be compliant, it has to have 15 exchanges of the total room air per hour. That's why they're so noisy and you've got those big air handlers up in the ceiling. Um, and those HVAC systems need to be maintained and, and filters changed. You can see that they do get dirty. When you look and, and sample the actual air in the operating room, using the ESU for five seconds can raise that concentration from 60,000 to a million particles per cubic foot. And that's not, not just next to the patient, that can be through the whole room. And it takes at least 20 seconds after the ESU is used to get that particulate number back down to baseline. So that's really um, kind of significant numbers if you think about it. So some of the engineering controls, some of the things that we are relatively easy to do um, are a lot of the different filters available. So that ULPA filter, which can um, filtrate out, you know, almost 100% of 0.12 microns, that can be part of an inline canister. Um, the true suction devices actually do a the suction systems do a better job than just attaching yourself to a wall suction. They they actually get rid of the smoke a lot better, but you can still apply a filter to a regular inline suction. And then the capture devices, I don't know if anyone has had the, um, the Go Clear um, AORN initiative at their hospital, but ours has, and all of our electrosurgery pencils now have a suction um, attachment on them. Um, and we also have suction attachments on our insufflators so that we can um, capture particulate matter. Um, those need to be pretty close when you're using the handheld. It's a little bulky, a little hard to get used to at first, but I have to say it is nice not to have the smoke in your face and you get used to it relatively quickly, but it does need to be close and it does need to be working with the um, suction uh, attached to your suction canister and the filters in place. As Tom mentioned, uh, COVID really brought a lot of this to the forefront because we weren't sure what was gonna transmit COVID during surgery for patients who had active infections. So just as a reminder, it's an RNA virus and it's small, it's 0.06 to 0.14 microns. And remember those um, N95s are good at filtering 0.3 microns. So hopefully they're catching it, but you wanna make sure they fit really well. Um, and as, you know, we know SARS-CoV-2 has been found in the nasopharynx, upper respiratory, lower respiratory tract, the whole GI tract in all sorts of fluids. What we don't really know is if the virus survives aerosolization. So if you do burn tissue that contains COVID, I'm not, I'm not aware that anybody has shown that the virus is still infective, but certainly it is not a risk I would necessarily want to take. And the same with all of these other viruses, right? I mean, COVID is new, but none of us have wanted to inhale papillomavirus or hepatitis C or HIV. So really the risks associated with viral transmission through aerosolization have been around for a long time and should be mitigated as much as possible. Um, and then you can see that we don't really know exactly how many virus 
viruses for, for COVID, but for influenza and norovirus, it really does not take very much. In open surgery, you definitely want to try to mitigate as much as possible. And again, you know, we have these really um, toxic <laughs> byproducts. So if smoke isn't evacuated, it really hangs out in the air. I'm sure we've all walked by the hallway and, and had that smell of, of electrosurgery smoke in the air and wondered what kind of case they were doing in that room. Um, some studies have shown that HPV infection can be present in the smoke, and um, you definitely want to use lower voltage uh, to try to decrease some of those risks, I think. Um, definitely the risk to the personnel was lower than N95, but um, you, can, you can definitely detect some viruses in smoke. So ideally, everyone's using an electrosurgery pencil with some kind of a suction device. I think we've all, as medical students, sat there suctioning smoke. But some of the newer um, products, I think, are better. Um, you know, the suction wand works if it's close, and it should be attached to the ultra-low particulate um, filter. And that can be expensive, but it's, it's worth it. And also, you know, you have to think about Room ventilation is good, but you need your local ventilation as well. When we think about laparoscopy, it can be easier to capture aerosolized products, but we need to still manage it. So you definitely don't want to have a lot of leakage around your ports. We still want to use ultra, ultra filtration when there's smoke. And again, a lot of the newer devices have that built in. You don't want to over insufflate and blow air out of the sides, so you want to use the lowest pressure that you need to do your case. Um, again, you want to have that suction running um, and you want to minimize using just a standard non filtered reservoir. As we've heard all along, we want to use energy efficiently, the lowest settings possible for the tissue effect that we want. And during desufflation, ideally, we will also capture any smoke through that ultrafiltration system and not blow it out into the room if you have that available. When a patient does have an infectious disease, so COVID, HPV, HIV, hepatitis, flu, everybody should be wearing their N95s, their highest level of protection. Um, if you are converting to an open operation, again, you want to do controlled desufflation unless you need to do some kind of a crash laparotomy. Um, and you should wait to take your specimen until all of the gas and smoke is out. Uh, leaky kind of suture closure devices. I know I'm a big fan of closure with the Carter Thomason, but maybe in, in this situation, that's not ideal because there is a lot of things blowing into your face sometimes. And so you might want to do a primary fascial closure after uh, desufflation. And again, the same with hand assisted surgery, there, there can be a lot of uh, leakage around those ports. SAGES has the full guidelines um, for the COVID response on their website, but this infographic here summarizes everything that we really just talked about. Um, if an endoscopy, it's similar precautions. Um, you want a dedicated OR for COVID-19, and we definitely want to minimize energy as much as possible. Uh, at this point, we actually think there is some benefit to using minimally invasive surgery with COVID-19, again, because of the containment of aerosolization. But you just definitely have to make sure that you evacuate it with an ultra high um, particulate filter and, and that it's not leaked, leaking. There are some papers on this, um, you know, including how ORs can manage um, communication when there will be a COVID patient and just how to clean afterwards and assume everything is contaminated. But essentially in conclusion, I think we all need to make it part of our daily practice to protect both ourselves, our team and our patients from surgical smoke and both infectious and toxic side effects of aerosolization and, and particulate matter. So you wanna use a, a surgical technique that reduces those risks as much as possible. And that is multifaceted. That includes 
the ventilation and filtration of the room. It includes ventilation and filtration, or rather filtration and suction locally at the patient with our energy devices and appropriate PPE for everybody involved. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Sharon. That was an awesome review. Terrific slide set. You'll see a lot of those in the hospital compliance module if anybody wants to see those. And um, I'm sorry I shortchanged you on time a little bit. I think I was jabbering too much in the middle. But with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining the FUSE webinar 2022. We'll probably be back in about two years. If you have the SCORE curriculum, we've got a nice, um, we've got a nice uh, sort of section in the SCORE curriculum under the essential or one of the essential topics that rotates through every two years. So there's some nice didactics there that you can look at or you can reach out to any one of us, particularly me. I'd, I'd love to hear from you if you're interested in energy. So thanks again for joining and thanks to all the speakers for your time. That was really a great session. Thank you, everybody.